と。と。と。と。と。と。と。と。と。と。と。と。と。と。と。と。と。と。と。と。と。と。Hi, welcome to the ninth conversation in the Dialogue Danse Actuelle series. I'm Marie Claire Forte, and I'm a dance artist, and I just put my hand on my microphone.、Um, and I'm honored to be here with Lara Kramer and Saba Khan. And we'll be together for about an hour. In the last 10 minutes, if there are questions, we will take them. So feel free throughout to just put them in the chat. And、um, we're going to end right at five. So I'm going to go ahead and ask you each to introduce yourselves. And Lara, I will invite you to go first.、Mm-hmm. So, Annie, bonjour. Lara Kramer and Adishna Kaz. Wasno de Nimikwe Andel. Wabjaji Dodin Martin Clan. London, Ontario, Nadonjaba, Jojage, Munyam, Montreal, Nadinda, and Ancestral Territory, Laxo First Nation, Treaty Three Territory.、Um, I'm also a member of Barents River First Nations.、Um, so my mother is、uh, Anishinaabe, Uji Cree, and my father is,、uh, has Mennonite ancestry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Saba Khan. I'm a lawyer and、uh, pianist and、um, mother. I'm、uh, born and raised in Montreal, j o j a g e which has been a long time known as a meeting place for many Indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe people. Thank you. I'm going to ask you a question to start us off,、um, which is can you each speak about your relationship to your family? Both immediate, extended, and also your family through time in relation to your practice, which you both have multiple practices. Would you like to be here? Sure. So, relationship to family,、um, I mean, that's been pretty,、uh, I want to say, an anchor within my, my practice.、Mm-hmm. Um, I want to say fairly young.、Um, Uh, my mother's a visual artist and my father's a musician. So I, I was really, I want to say, in a kind of an ecology of creation as a, at a very young age.、Um, and, you know, my work has always been pretty、uh, closely linked to the connection、um, on my Anishinaabe roots with、um, regards to also the experiences my, my mother went through. Uh, she's a residential school survivor.、Mm-hmm. Um, and so for me, there was a point where my, my work really connected to,、um, you know, I often will frame it as saying it's uh, connected to uh, generational knowledge,、um, also the impacts of, of the effects of residential schools. So,、um, displacement from territory,、uh, severing of connections through mother and child. Um, and for me, my practice was a, it felt like a, in a way a scaffolding to, to, to further、um, process, but you know, in a way I can frame it also as a healing practice, but a, a practice to further, I want to say, like the, the scar tissue from、mm-hmm. those impacts.、Uh, so I didn't always work、uh, with my mother, although she, I would say, is a you know, big influencer in my practice and my, my methodology and my, my approach.、Um, I'd say more recent years, maybe stemming on the last like, eight years,、mm-hmm. um, I would often bring her in studio or be in creative processes with her, both、um, like、in studio or outside. Um, and my children, too. I have, I have two young children.、Um, both have been very much the fabrics of a few of my creations. I've also performed a couple times with my eldest,、uh, Ruby.、Yes. Um, and I think that centering of that the generational work for me,、um, I mean, I think it's, I also view it as like, It, 
it's something that was uh, severed through the generations of my mother's family for multiple generations. You know, so my, my grandmother is also a residential school survivor. And I think um, that connection, um, that generational connection that's so foundational in, in just life and, and living um, in practice and in story and song and in traditions, um, that is something that has been deeply raptured um, here, you know, as an act of, uh, you know, intent of, of genocide uh, for, for many indigenous uh, bodies. And it's still, it's still in our, our living memory. Um, and that practice for me to, to work in relation with my mother and children, it, it, it's, you know, it, it doesn't come through like a simplicity. It's, for me, there's been, there's something that I've had to confront and had to process as more, I would say, through that mother, um, daughter relationship with my mother. Um, but at the same time, it feels that it's, yeah, it, it's, it's something that was ruptured and that um, should have, you know, never happened. But in part, it, it feels like, um, you know, it, 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 it's an inheritance that I have rights to and that I, I, I feel like there's a process of like reclaiming that. And that's what the work has been about, you know. Um, when I when I veer from saying it's not a simplicity, I don't I don't gauge anyone else's like family foundation as it being simple. But what I mean there is like a a feeling that those relations um, they're a birthright, right? In a sense, and and I think that the fact that there it was such a conscious. Um, you know, system here yeah. on Turtle Island to sever the mother, uh, children, parent, children relationships, and it continues today. Yeah. You know, um, with a lot of indigenous uh, communities, and I, um, for me, that's just been a big, a big journey in arriving in a place where I, I can um, work in a relationship with my mother. I didn't always have that. Um, relationship in my life due to the impacts of residential school. It wasn't always there. So it's a practice that's built and that you've, um, yeah, I, I hear a lot of in, intentionality mm -hmm. in that this practice in relationship to family being very, very like, look at me using language, very intentional. Absolutely. And very intentionally building. Yeah, and I feel so privileged to be in a place where when I can gather with um, having my children and mother to gather just, you know, even over a meal, even outside of arts, you know, let's say, for me, that's a wealth, there's a wealth of knowledge, a transmission of knowledge that occurs, right, mm -hmm. that I haven't always been privy to, or I haven't always had the opportunity to. Um, and for me, that's been... Yeah, a large part of my, I want to say my, for talking about arts practice, like my career journey, you mm -hmm. know, really from, from a young age. Which is tied to your living journey. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, they don't feel so separate. And thank you, Saba. Um, I would say that in, uh, family histories have also shaped um, my practice in mm -hmm. law. And I grew up in a home that was politically charged in the sense that my parents were from India. My father lived through the partition of India and Pakistan and um, all the histories of British occupation over you know, their land and the impacts that it had on people. Um, so the sense of justice was always sort of brewing. It was mm -hmm. there in the home. Um, some of the, you know, activists that my father would talk about, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King. I remember going to see Nelson Mandela in Montreal when I was 12 years old. Um, and then, you know, by the time I got into high school, it was the time of the Bosnia-Herzegovina war, the genocide. Um, and one of my first jobs was working for this small organization in Montreal um, where we were assisting refugees and helping rape victims. And so, I think that from very early on, those experiences shaped, you know, my interest in, in justice and, um, you know, going to law school was sort of, you see how bureaucratic that world really is and that um, 
especially at a young age, starts to become this naive dream, really. Um, and then you start negotiating, you know, your place there, um, because uh, being born into a system that does not belong to you, uh, you know, living through it, knowing that it's the only way to change things, you know, is, is really through the system itself sometimes. Yeah. Um, and so I think that history of, of um, you know, colonialism, resistance, uh, the, the imbalances of power that I've, I was exposed to because of these politically charged discussions in my home, I think they definitely shaped, you know, where my legal career sort of navigated itself to. Um, and then I grew up in a home that was chaotic as well. So, um, you know, very sort of extroverts all around. And uh, in that space, I, I sought, you know, my own space sort of. And nature mm -hmm. became um, really a comfort zone for me. Um, the outside spaces, the changing of the seasons. And, and I think that eventually that sort of came into my legal practice as well. Um, because as I explored different parts of the law, I realized that, you know, um, the laws that have to do with nature, the way that we treat nature, those relationships, um, you know, they became, it became a prominent uh, area for me. And um, with family, it's interesting because I grew up in a home with scientists that were also very deeply into culture and music. And mm -hmm. um, I was introduced to a space or sort of born into a space where, um, you know, I, I, could and you know could embrace music and art and sport and you know sort of like there was no um, there was no lawyers in my family for instance mm -hmm. and I think as I grew up I never lost that part of myself that identity of you know I'm not just one thing I can't be categorized but um, you know I, I live and, and work in multiple contexts and I communicate through different contexts as well it can be musical it can be through law or writing but mm -hmm. it's always, um, you know, a voice that has a particular, you know, tone to it, let's say. Um, so I would say that that's the way that childhood has kind of affected my practice. And then if I look forward, you know, to the children that I had or whatnot, um, I think that they've um, brought this, you know, sort of this timelessness uh, introduced it into my life. And, you know, think about the times when you're, um, with your baby and you're in a park and you just have no choice but to let go of time. Um, and so I think that the, the children have just shaped, you know, the way that I approach my work and mm -hmm. the way I see time and productivity itself. Beautiful. And do you say, your, would you say your children grew up in a politically charged home as well? Or um, I would say less. Um, and, um, you know, the, I mean, their parents come from a different childhood and, and yeah. existence than um, the political context that my parents were raised in. Um, and they actually have that balance of also, um, you know, being born, raised in a home where it's, there's just all kinds of things happening. And, um, you know, there's, there's no specialization in any way or expectations. Um, and I think that that's really been important for them to, or just to, or for me as a parent to let them be and find themselves rather than push them through specific silos and whatnot. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, can you speak, Laura, I've, I've heard you speak so beautifully about the labor and practice of going back to your community and your land and the trap line, this mm. incredibly voluntary, beautiful intentional relationship to nature mm -hmm. in terms of that land. Mm -hmm. And also I have a sense of like, you probably have a relationship to nature, the nature and like the nature in the city mm -hmm. as, as it exists. So maybe we could, you could both speak about your intentional relationship to nature and you, you talking about it as a, as a haven and a place of comfort from, uh, from the extroverted charged energy of your family how how that plays into your practice and how you nurture it um yeah so my i guess going back to this uh connection to um yeah i frame that really as like ancestral territory it's um 
So Laxville First Nation is the community where my grandmother was born. Um, and we have many, it goes back quite a few generations. Um, and my, my first experience is being up there. So my mother wasn't born in the community. Her, uh, she, my grandmother, um, following residential school, didn't really replant roots back in the community. She, uh, herself and her sisters ended up migrating um, to uh, Manitoba because mm -hmm. it's close to the Manitoba border. Um, Laxville is situated quite far north in Ontario, I guess. Um, if people know Thunder Bay, it's about four and a half hours north of uh, Thunder Bay. Um, so my grandmother had um, her children um, in the city um, and many of them uh, went through, well, all of them went through um, either uh, residential school, foster care, uh, one auntie was adopted out. Um, so they didn't have this um, tie of, of growing up in the community. Mm -hmm. Although I do, there's pictures of my mother being up there quite young um, with, with uh, her mother and grandparents. Um, my great grandfather, Robert Wesley, was chief of the reserve for about 20 years um, and had had a, a trap line and he uh, carried and passed that over to, to a, a, a grandchild. Um, so uh, I, I we don't always follow these, um, I will say like, uh, Aunties aren't always aunties. Uh, sometimes they're your cousin or second cousin, but yes. because of age, you just, I think of her as an auntie, but she's my mother's first cousin. And so Lillian, she, she uh, carried on this trap line and lived in the bush and my mother would go and, and visit her um, when she was a young adult and, and when we were children would go up. So I have these very, um, I wanna say clear, like, it's funny, I almost think of like a, 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 a sonic and, an imagery um, memory of, of the land, the landscape, because at times we visited in the summer, but in the in the north, like being on the skidoos and being by the ice hole in the bush, like there was something just... Um, you said a sonic memory. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Like just the, I can, can feel the, the cold. Yeah. I can like, I can hear the cold. I can like, you yeah. know, I have this writing piece I wrote about like, talking to the fish in the ice hole, you know, and this memory of like dialoguing with them. And my mother kind of, I, I she was such, um, I want to say, um, just, I felt she created space for so much of the imagination to just be, be uh, like fluid. Like we didn't have a very uh, verbal relationship. We were very much in, my mom was a practicing artist at the time. So, you know, we were always parallel together, working with our hands, creating and the nonverbal. So these early memories really impacted me. And I guess somewhere, um, probably during my pregnancy with my firstborn, um, I, I, I started dialoguing with my mom saying, you know, I, I want to go back up there, you know, and, just building the contacts, building the resources to be able to do so. And when Ruby uh, was three months old, I, I had my first trip up there as an adult, you know, um, connecting with, with cousins, second cousins. Um, yeah, being able to go out in the bush and see like the area of the trap line. Um, and for me, that's, um, I, I can't um, always fully put it into language, like the, the, the effects or the impact, but it's, I mean, it's definitely interesting being amongst so much family, like, you know, they, they'll, they understand and like, oh, Emily's daughter or granddaughter, you know, yeah. and, and, and seeing cousins with similar like cheekbones and structures and just being in that, that relationship with family that is so, it's so vast. Like the, you know, my, my great grand uh, parents had um, 14 children and it's it's just large it's it's large in the stories and the territory and the community um, so there's a feeling of abundance there's a feeling of um, I mean it's not all um, beautiful either there's some devastating realities as well um, but the 
for me, there's, there's, yeah, like I guess I say, abundance of knowledge to to kind of soak my uh -huh. myself in, and so I've been retur returning up there uh, as free. You, sh you know, I try to go uh, biannually or annually if I can, um, and yeah, in, in recent years, um, it, I, you know, I got prompted to to get my. Um, like to to be on to go on the trap line and be prepared to do that. So that was a whole undertaking I sort of went through last year with um, um, because of regulations of of you know we were talking early earlier off camera about like policies and what have you, but the regulations of trap lines and the way treaty is also set up. There there's there's a requirements of licensing, right? Although, yes. and it gets into these paradoxes because, um, you know, even I have, even though I have status and we have these so-called rights to treaty, there's still these bureaucratical licensing. So yeah, I went through and got my trapping license, my gun license, my hunting, all these licenses, but it's like, yeah, the, these interesting paradoxes for to just arrive at a place for a family to be able to take me out on the land, you know, and, and be in, you know, what is like the oldest land based practice here on Turtle Island, you know, and it's um, I think for me, the, the desire for that was, um, yeah, it's going back in, to this like experiential learning and, and the, the transmission of knowledge that is just gone through uh, so many generations. Um, I mean, it's also political too. It's it's a way to exercise treaty, uh, not just treaty rights, but re treaty responsibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's beautiful as you're talking, you're, there's no separation between the nature and your family. Like they're, they keep folding into each other mm. because they're not, of course, separate. Like, you know, we, in the, in the title of this conversation was this prompt about recontextualizing the humans and their environment, but it's like that we are of it, it is of us. And it's quite interesting as I'm listening to you, seeing you um, weave those two without um, separating them. Yeah. And um, you were saying, I don't always have the language and you're doing this vibration. And <laughs> I'm wondering because you work in international law and you were talking about doing this litigation and doing these processes to give people the tools to implement policies or to change things and how that how how you how did you flow from like nature to lang like law being such a language being such a fundamental like the authority in law like mm -hmm. from this you being with the seasons to you being like yeah um it's interesting because language is the heart of law and um it can be so easily manipulated and uh, mm -hmm. i think you know the art of lawyers is also to take language and use it the way that they want to in that uh, respect so i find that um there's language is really a tactic when it comes to to legal thinking and um and um it's funny because when I went from justice, my first, you know, as, as a child, like this preoccupation with justice, um, my first entry into law was uh, working uh, in labor law. So on union side uh, files, and I was in Geneva, uh, I was assisting this committee that would get complaints from plantation workers in South America or whatnot. So it was all labor rights. And gradually from there, um, you know, I started to realize as you grow into the, I guess, into your lawyerliness or what you call it, um, that that exploitation of humans is like fundamentally based on the exploitation of nature. That, mm -hmm. um, you know, if we think about all these commodity chains and, you know, people who are being um, enslaved through forced labor, modern slavery, which is also on the rise, you know, um, that all of that is really based on also extracting from nature. Mm -hmm. And, um, then, you know, from there, I think it just slowly sort of like shed all interest in other fields of law and um, just trying to figure out what is environment, you know, it's inside the law and how can we change it? Um, you know, we're living in a context in Canada, which we've got so many reports from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We've got so many reports also 
from UN bodies talking about the environmental racism faced by indigenous peoples here. Um, and yet the way that environment is treated in the law, it's, it's, it's an object, right? To be possessed or it's property. It's, it's not a relation, which is something that I've learned through a lot of different indigenous elders that I've got to work with. Um, there's uh, the elder Gwich'in, elder Sarah James from Arctic Village, Alaska. Um, you know, she's done, she's been fighting pipelines in the Arctic refuge for the last like decades mm -hmm. um, and her fight continues. And just hearing her talk about law or the way that she, you know, that storytelling, um, it's such a different way of speaking about law or sharing law than mm -hmm. what you see in UN conferences or, you know, colonial systems that we live in. Mm -hmm. um, and so that just fascinates me. And um, recently I've gotten to do a lot of work on these legal evolutions happening where um, we were talking before about the rights of corporations, right, um, which translate into French as moral persons. And, um, you know, nature, though, has no voice in, in the law, typically. And now we're seeing this new movement towards the rights of nature where, you know, rivers can speak for themselves or mm -hmm. uh, different landscapes. And for me, that's fascinating because... I think that's the only way that we can, you know, we talk about decolonizing, um, but do we really understand how to? Do we understand what that looks like and what it means when it comes to changing those like fundamental principles that are underneath our law and, and sort of like, um, you know, play a huge role in, in what we can or can't do, like the regulations you're talking about, you know? Um, These licenses and, for you to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, sorry. Yeah, and just to say, like, that's what I find that's very, you know, it's uh, it's interesting. Like, it's really always the discrete zoning laws and the things that go imperceived that have a huge control on everyone's lives. And for me, seeing the law in the landscape like that, um, seeing how oppressive it has been, like, mm -hmm. you know, t up till now, and the potential for change, I think that's really what draws me to, um, to practicing environmental law and... And thinking about how we can bring it to like a new, a new, um, a new era. Right. I just, I had a moment. But I was one of the places I grew up in in Hull, where when we moved, the mayor who was in the mafia, and this was, it's I'm not spilling beans. It's it's uh, public knowledge, but changed the zoning so that houses could be built where it was previously a park, but it was very much like this person was just able to change. The, and I was like, but shouldn't, shouldn't there be another? When I learned of this, I remember thinking like, is that all it takes? Like, I've got enough power to, to work the language to do this license that will then allow all of these things without consulting any, like there's no, these, how the law doesn't have built-in accountability. It's mm -hmm. really an abstract thing. And then how to build relationality, I think, is really exciting. Like, if a river has rights, then what are, how will we relate to it differently? Mm -hmm. It's quite a beautiful, a beautiful path to trouble the system. Um, I'm gonna check. What? supports you in in nourishing your relationships to nature or maybe i can ask because you both live in montreal actually before is what what is your relationship to nature in the city and i'm like as, as though you're one person um well i i enjoyed a walk walking basically and um also um you know, I grew up doing karate and I used to be on a Canadian team. And so oh. I have, um, and my Jap my karate style is called Wadokai, which is the way of harmony. And the way that, what that translates into is basically the philosophies that the body should be like water. And so to adapt to any container that you're in sort of flow rather than certain karate styles, which are, um, the body's a rock. So you sort of like, you know, Sort of, you know, you stand your ground. Yeah. yeah. And so it's something I have to say that, you know, walking or even doing my karate practice like now, it's um, it feels that there is, you know, part of like nature is a part of that, too. Mm -hmm. um, it, even if it means like in the morning waking up and feeling the wind and, you know, going to do my practice. Um, but I feel that, um, yeah, it's just the 
I think walking in the parks and um, just, uh, I guess, toning down that, that time is the way that I would, that I feel the city. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it's, it, it feels like a little bit of a challenging relationship. You know, it's, I think I go through phases where I, I feel like um, even though there's such a strong uh, urban landscape that we're um, immersed in, um, I mean, there's still these uh, I, these large pockets of, of nature, right? And sometimes I feel like it's just like, yeah, the, the sky world, you know? It's like every morning, this is like the acknowledgement, the acknowledgement of, of, of the sky world. That's what I see first thing, you know, is, mm -hmm. is the... Oh. Beautiful. The sky, the, the trees through my window and, and um, yeah, I think, I think, you know, this might lead into, I know you have other questions and we were talking about um, previously like temporality and that, that relationship. And I think that um, in times where I feel like, I don't know, I, I think there's times where it's like if I've been, let's say, immersed you know, in nature, and then I come back to the city, and you can kind of feel that, like, mm -hmm. um, that those shifts in the body, you know, or it's maybe it's even like a, like a fraction of myself is only fully alive, you know, like there's a, a part of me that's had to dim down or something. Um, sometimes I feel like I do tap into a certain, um, like level of connecting to nature whether it's like with the trees or noticing the bugs or what have you you know and 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 that pacing you know like you know just like the other day I saw like the, a robin and it, it was raining we had one of our first like kind of spring like rainfalls but I was like I think the earth's too like frozen stuff for the worms to be there you know and I was like dialoguing with my children about this you know like we're we're still in that in-between zone but um I, yeah, I don't know if that's fully answering your question. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like, um, yeah, there, there's a challenge to the relationship in the way of, um, you know, I feel like there's, there's a multitude of windows and opportunity to connect, but yeah. it's, it's, it takes a certain kind of, yeah, more consciousness and more, um, yeah, uh, uh, like a, a softer listening because it's it's not necess it's you know it's very different being in yeah. the bush right where you have this <laughs> well the sonic this, landscape of the city it's like, yeah. yeah yeah it's, it's stronger this interesting like um, yeah. yeah web of, of dynamics at play right like mm -hmm. that hyper speed and then this other kind of uh, more self imposed way of being that is very more organic and yeah yeah i'm wondering because you're a pianist and auteur compositrice interprète uh just because you're talking about the sound and and you play the piano and uh how nature feeds into that practice or what kind of sound are you aiming to add into the world mm -hmm. I'm, that's Maybe that's ridiculous, but... No, it's a good question. Um, I would say that nature doesn't consciously enter into that. And uh -huh. um, I guess the closest way that I would say nature appears is that it's an organic process for me, music making. Mm -hmm. um, I used to, when I was younger, play in band contacts with, you know, pretty standard chants, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I was pregnant, I sort of felt like, you know, it wasn't for me anymore, performing, being on stage. Like, I just felt this disconnect with that and wanting to explore sort of my own music or do it alone. And I started layering different um, vintage Wurlitzers and keyboards with pianos and layering my voice on itself, too. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think that I have sort of followed a natural rhythm in the sense that there was no... Um, order to the songs, you know, like no structure, no like bridge, bridge, chorus, verse, or anything like that. I mean, I just sort of let myself feel it, and and this and the writing came, and the songs came, and and that's very, um, it's very organic for me. Um, mm -hmm. It's interesting though, because I find that 
the younger I was, the easier it would be to make music. Mm. And then as you grow older, you sort of, you know, you're, you, you set expectations for yourself or you expect a different kind of quality of your, from your oeuvre. So this, the, the time it takes to get there is longer. Um, and um, it's, uh, yeah, it's not, I would say that it's, it's a natural process, but uh-huh. maybe the themes that I touch upon, you know, have to do with nature. Um, well, just even what you describe, like the layering and the not thinking bridge, bridge, like not not the formula, not the form, mm-hmm. but the, mm-hmm. the process and the building. It's can I just bounce off of this about something you said earlier, because it's easier when you're younger. We were talking about this piece. Remind me the title, the trio. Oh, my God. Tame. <laughs> Tame. And you. You said it was such an ambitious work. It was, like, so, I was so difficult young. at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, sure. What is it about youth that gives us, we just think we can do anything. Like, we're just yeah. like, yeah, I'll do that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What, like, can you speak about how, in retrospect, it seems ambitious to you? Or just because you said it's come so much more easily. Oh. I mean, I think, like, I just think of, I, I went for, like, a full-on... Um, like demanding like you know I've always really had agency over my own scenography and set design so it was there were so many objects so many like particular pieces and that alone was like hefty to manage and deal with and and I um, also went through a period of of becoming um, a single mother with uh, an infant so in my personal life, it was like there was so much, you know, going on. <laughs> like yeah. I can't say shit here, but you know, I think you can. It's it, there was so much going on there, but it was like I had like this. I don't know. It was like this big push to to go somewhere so different theatrically than what my I felt my previous works had had been, and. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to, I mean, that. I think, you know, I said it's difficult, but part of my, you know, my creative processes were, you know, and on a very personal level have also been like my through line of like mental health, right? Like for yes. so many years, you know, mm-hmm. it's been, it, and, and sometimes more than others. So I think for me, it was like, um, it was something as my, you know, personal life was very much dealing with a lot of turmoil. Um, I had this focus, um, you know, and uh, I guess I just was like, I'm going to just keep going with this, you know, mm-hmm. even if it's like, I think at times it felt like the collapse of it was like there. But in a way, I just I also felt accepting of that, like, you know, we need to fail at what we do mm-hmm. and not, I don't know if failure is the right thing, but like, um, just, a, and I, and I think I trust so much, um, creative process as like, it's in some ways you can say it's lived experience. So the life with inside of it, even if there's mishaps or things are collapsing, um, that generates something in the in the body and the psyche and the expression and it's all part of the memory bank right it's all mm-hmm. part of it so that for me like it fit with the work like even if shit's like i'm a, like oh lara's not fully present today cuz like you know she's dealing with this or that a lawyer or something that's taking you know i, I would i would still show up and i would give what i could you know and i felt like um all of that still becomes part of the container of, of what's inside of that, that yeah. world that you're birthing, you know? Um, I can't remember what the... Me we neither. We were talking but, about um, at the beginning, but... Sort of the, I think, it, like the, the... How maybe we access creativity and practice very differently at a younger age. Right. Mm. But also, I didn't know these things when I saw that work, and I was... Right. You know, it was blown away. I, I can't even describe it in three words because it was so multiple. But like at one point, Angie wrapped herself up in toilet paper. Over a long period of time, wrapped her whole body oh, up in toilet simple. paper and laid on a, right. like a plastic lounge chair. 
Mm-hmm. And like, I feel like Karina was rolling cigarettes endlessly, like just for very, like with all these little things going on and just, sort of nothing yeah. happened. And then there was this big climax and, but the whole time nothing was happening, but a million things were happening. It was very mm-hmm. like this latent tension. It was a very, it was, ex, it was an extraordinary choreography team. But the time, I think you just brought up something like that stretching of time yeah. and that for sure was like a, you know, a, one of the choreographic it, materials for sure. And, and what you interest. And when you're talking about this layering, I'm like, oh, this is related to time too. like how we can um, maybe those relationships between like family, nature, land, like protection, that it, it is a layered nature isn't I mean, even the rock, like all these forces have shaped it over billions of years and then it's just there in front of us and we just think rock and you're like, no, but everything, like as you said, it's in the memory bank. There's a lot held there. Mm -hmm. And you were saying the music is more difficult to access now or it's longer or it's a different, Mm -hmm. can you speak about how how experience and age have, has changed your relationship to creative Mm -hmm. practice? So I think that, you know, in terms of music, it's always also a question of who you're collaborating with and your, you know, musical partners that shape the the process and the the outcome of that. And um, I think that when it comes to age, though, I would say it's really just a matter of life experience that, Mm -hmm. you know, it's it's easier. Even if I make the link to parenting, for instance, I became a mom rather young, um, but it was sort of you don't have time to think things through. You're just sort of doing as you're going Mm -hmm. and you know, but I see some of my friends or my brother, you know, who's like had children later on. It's everything's a little bit more thought out or sort of there's just a different um, there's a different vibe to it, I would say. Um, and I think that we're just uh, maybe it's the, the youth or the naivete or just not caring that invincible feeling that you have mm-hmm. when you're young or you're putting out things and you have nothing to I guess you have nothing to compare it to either, you know, in, yeah. in terms of like your own. Your, your series of oeuvre or art forms or whatever. But I think the further you go, the more complex maybe your practice becomes, then you you want to evolve. I mean, some, some people don't, you know, some people are comfortable playing in a specific genre and, um, you know, continuing to do that. So they don't seek an evolution in their sound necessarily. Yes, it's so, it's so funny. I was like, right, we're all speaking as people I'm assuming. Of course, I'm like, oh, I know that your musical practice has changed. I know that your choreographic practice has changed. Like I know that you are both intuitively artists that aren't, you didn't find a groove and then you're like, I'm gonna produce more of that because I know it works. Exactly, Mm. but I mean, a lot of the industry is like that and does that. And so for me, like knowing that I can't do that, I wasn't interested in doing that. And so it was, you know, a challenge to myself. Mm -hmm. And um and, and but also this is linked to productivity. I think like I think that you know when you're when you call yourself an artist, you think okay, you should be doing art all the time, <laughs> and then there's this stress that comes with it. With you know um, like being comfortable with empty time, that incubation period mm-hmm. where you know you'll have come out with something, and then knowing that you can give yourself like months, years if you need to just sort of re you know um, or I guess recalibrate your yourself with you know, mm-hmm. in your experience with your your art form. I think that's a big part of it. And that's something that I've only learned, I think, now. And, you know, it could also be like, as we're coming out of the pandemic, like everything has changed, right? Time and what, it, what is the meaning of work and productivity? And, um, and I think that that whole like experience uh, really shifted my own understanding of like, what I expect for myself and what I want to do or the artifacts that I want to bring into the world. And, Mm -hmm. you know, now I really think of, of, uh, like spending my time as that, like, as in, you know, uh, the, the meaningfulness or like the significance of the artifacts that I want to bring in, whether it be a legal piece or writing or whether it be a song or, you know, a collage. Um, but I think it's that, like, just that, like where, yeah, I, I mean, it helps me to think about, you know, existential threats like working in climate change. It's, you know, you can't ignore the fact that like this is the critical decade for action. And then trying to process that, you know, um, and find out how you can create meaning out of that. And um, so that's been very special to me, just like thinking about, um, you know, the, the billions of years that Earth has existed and 
you know, what can we draw out from that history and um, what can we leave as part of that history? Yes, I'm just, thank you. I'm feeling like, oh, we need to take a moment to just rehear in our heads, like we're in the critical decade for climate mm -hmm. action and how, what the word critical does in me. Like I have a sense of panic and disempowerment and like, what are we going to, and then I'm like, no, no. Saba's here. We're all we're all working. Like, Lara's there. She's got all the licenses. You went oh, through geez. the bureaucracy. Not to put <laughs> pressure, but that, um, yeah. This this sense of like, what do we want to leave? What are the traces? But also, what is the history, and how, and. Um, like what I'm hearing about you speak about this process when uh, your firstborn was an infant, it's like you, in it, you were learning that your presence, no matter how complete or incomplete, was exactly what you could offer to the moment. Mm -hmm. And how what you're describing, this intentionality around what it is you produce, it has to do with this, like, what is the quality of presence that I can give to this as opposed to what am I going to produce? Um, I need to think, and I'm a slow thinker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, maybe because you, you, you spoke about nursing your child in a park and having to let go of time, and my child nursed a lot. Like, wow, this person ate a lot. And I, I do remember this feeling of like, there is nothing else, like there's nothing else I can be doing at this time and feeling like that was the biggest blessing of, of some kind, like this, te like this mm -hmm. radical other, like, tsh, like you think you need to, but like, no, mm -hmm. you have to release. And also the, the privilege of, mm -hmm. of having, having that time and, we spoke about this briefly before, but how uh, being mothers maybe changed your relationship to time or speed or duration mm -hmm. or, or process. Mm -hmm. And you even speak about like you connecting to your mother when you were pregnant. Like, what is it about? Um, is there something about that, your relationship to time that you continue to foster in this way? Or was it just a change and now it's now it's one thing or is it is it changing as the midlife is is around mm -hmm. like how is it how are you living linear time maybe that's a small question <laughs> um well i don't know i mean recently to be just really in practical terms i oh, guess yeah. um you know i've been thinking of it as morning afternoon <laughs> and yeah. evening you know and the morning i mean my name actually it means um the morning breeze and it, oh. i remember being like on the ocean front like on uh, when I was nine and there was this warm wind in the morning and my mom was like Saba that's that's your name like that's what it means and there was always this connection to the morning like apparently I was born at 6 a.m Monday morning so oh. I identify with the morning and for me it's just you know I've decided that that's my time and um, so I give myself the morning and I think mm -hmm. it's really about taking back time because you're conditioned you know as you move along you become a mother you know you've got to fulfill people's needs you have to fulfill your own needs put food on the table that kind of thing and um, I think that it becomes too easy to 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 just give away time and uh, it's had to be very intentional for me to mm -hmm. to take back that time. Um, and it's something I've only learned, you know, um, very recently as well. Um, but um, it's, yeah, it's really important for me to, to have my mornings and to decide that, you know, like that's not part of the linear time that I'm willing to give the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it makes me think, I mean, for sure, my uh, approach and, and way of working, um, while that, that, extend, that extension of, of my, my children within my universe and then that expanding, um, you know, to older generations, generations that aren't here, you know, and I, I think of future generations as well. Um, I was just thinking, too, how, um, I mean, not 
not just, I feel like, arts practice um, that I've engaged in, um, like through my like certain visual work, you know, with, with like beading or, or that's a lot more time-based um, or, or really anchored in a sense of duration. I feel like it has an effect, but um, I was just going to quickly say, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, no, uh, like I started learning uh, Ojibwe uh, the last two years. My mom speaks Nishambe and is a teacher, and, and I I felt like um, the, the learning of the language um, has such a shift on like I don't I don't know how to exactly say this but it's like it has a, it uh, like the cultures embedded in the language right and uh-huh. the the, the Nishambe, um just way of being is there in, in in its relationality to all things to place to so I feel like when I am um, learning and speaking it and it's starting to like I mean it's a it's a slow process but there's these little these shifts of of um yeah these it's a it's another relationship I guess I want to say to time Uh because it isn't like the language in itself doesn't have that western construct of of time definitive time right it's it's there's this all um for me there's it, it yeah it's just this expanding horizon and I'm still learning you know and it's but I for me this is such a um, like interesting practice of like learning and how it digests into my system and yeah I mean it's beautiful and it makes me think of your mother giving you that gift of that morning breeze on the ocean and mm-hmm. then like you said it and then I fused you with that image that you gave me and how like like language can uh I mean, it, I find it fails us in so many ways, but then also it's such, it's such a huge connector and it, it can mm-hmm. open those po- perceptual portals to include more and more and more and more and more and more. And then to, so that those, those separations of things that like you were mentioning, like that lawyers can essentially build out of language, they can build nothing out of language and then collaborate onto systems and then people are like what's happening and you're like oh it's this language somebody made but that if it becomes re reattached to the human then it it reattaches to the world it reattaches and it can be generative in that way maybe uh just as we're getting towards the end of our time together you can name like a sustaining force for your practice in relationship to nature or in relationship to time or in relationship to your family? Another small question. Oh. Like what, what, is, what is feeding you? Um, I think that, you know, as sustaining forces, I, I feel that I'm held by this, um, you know, amazing like family that I'm a part of. And, mm-hmm. and I feel that... Um, like an extension of something, you know, is, is, and I think that sustains my, um, like I know, um, or maybe it's just motherhood or, you know, that responsibility towards others. I think that's what really sustains me, whether it be people I work with or make music with or, you know, my children. Um, but it's just feeling like a part of the ecosystem that's really something. And, and also like the dawn and the dusk, like just the cycle of the earth. It's, um, I think it's very grounding. Like you were saying to look at the sky world and, you know, I can see Jupiter and Venus from my balcony every day, you know, so yeah. it's always like, how far are they today? And, and I think like, it's that kind of thing. Like when you feel, when you look up, you really uh, understand how infinitesimally small our, our lives are in a certain way. Or, um, and I think that's really, um, it's inspiring for me. It's scary, and it's also something that keeps me together. I think that's so beautiful. I remember my child, very little, being out when the moon was out, and uh, she was saying, "Oh, I would like to give a hug to the moon." Like, and then I was looking, and I was like, "Oh, she's really got loving feelings about them." That's not just—it's not abstract. It's mm. very concrete. And then we 
we walked a long way and she was like, it's always with us. Like she just couldn't even get over how great. And I was like, oh my like, no, like, Aww. no, yeah. you know, she wasn't three. Yeah. Um, That's so beautiful. It makes my, makes me think of um, my mom would always say like, you know, when she'd have these times of feeling, um, you know, a little sad because family is so displaced across Turtle Island with her, everything that's happened. She, she would just say, oh, the, tr the trees are our relatives. Like, this is our family, you know? Oh. And that connection. And I don't know, for me, the, yeah, I guess what sustains me is very similar. I think, I think it's those um, relations around where, I mean, in a lot of ways, I feel so fortunate. Like, I have these anchors, you know? I think... Um, the responsibility of, of mothering and, and then being a daughter and community member. Like they, there's, there's something that I feel, uh, yeah, there's just like a strong anchor. And I think that is, um, I feel and have gratitude for that. Yeah. That's so, I, I love hearing you. I love hearing you. I, I think there's a lot of talk about like how tiring it is to be a parent. And I'm like, but it's so much <laughs> like it's so sustaining. It is sustaining mm -hmm. to be responsible to someone. It is like it yeah. is sustaining to me to have parents and right. family and a community that I am like holding and held by mm -hmm. that it, relationships are not a burden. They're a, a privilege in yeah. a way. And that a lot of forces are about like a lot of cultural forces are about severing these relationships that are sustaining so it's it's quite beautiful to hear you articulate that were you gonna sorry were you gonna say no. something no i misread the body language um mm -hmm. i don't have anything edifying to ask or add um maybe just one no i i just don't i don't have anything so I'm I'm going to say thank you because I know we're we're near the end of our time together. Thank you to the people who watch now or later. Who can say? Thank you, Saba. Thank you, Lara, for your generosity and intelligence and very important and radical work in the world. Uh, I am grateful for it for you, and uh, thank you for Art Circulation for hosting these conversations. That's it.